Okay. So my uh, major part of my talk today, I'm going to actually discuss some uh, phenomena in granular systems and suspensions where we have been able to get insight using this height formalism. But before that, I will just sort of bring to whatever closure I can of this whole Edwards idea, because then you will see that the Edwards idea sort of in, enters only indirectly in what we do. Uh, so, so let me, and I'll show some experimental data, which are tests of the Edwards ensemble. And that will have a different notation, which I will. So remember, what did I do yesterday after through the whole Dimer discussion and the discussion yesterday? I argued that there is a conserved quantity, which is tensorial, which is a flux, which is if you give me a granular assembly, which have only contact forces, right? We went through the whole discussion of the contact network. I'm going to sum over all the contacts in that macroscopic system. And construct this quantity, right? That's the definition of it. You can think of it as a virial. You can think of it as, so the trace of this is just the virial pressure. Does everyone see that? How many of you know how to define the virial stresses and the virial pressures? All of Srikant students should, yes. Okay, so this is, this is that, right? But what I showed is that if you now impose the constraints of force balance, then this is conserved because this becomes a boundary integral. Right? So if I put my whole system and I just look at the boundary integral, that's, this becomes a boundary integral. So unless I do things at the end or if I have periodic boundary conditions, this doesn't change. So this is the this is a conserved quantity for systems that satisfy constraints of force balance. In addition, Edwards had argued that volume is a conserved quantity. That is a, still a bit problematic. So I'm not going to talk about this at all. But for hard spheres, I think it's, it, it, you can think of how, what kind of volume is conserved. For any sort of deformable particles or soft spheres, what volume is conserved is really tricky. And then if you, uh, think about the concept of rattlers, then it becomes even more tricky. Right? What, which grains do we include in your ensemble? If you say I insist on mechanical stability, the rattlers don't play any role in it. So should I think of them as part of my volume, or should I only look at the grains that are part of my force network as my volume, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, right? It went away. We'll come back. So I'm going to just focus on this for now. If we want to add the volume, if ever we figure out that the volume is, has some kind of conserved conservation laws, then we can add to it. There's no problem. So what does the Edwards, in, so if I say now, okay, so this is all I have shown. Now if I say, okay, let's assume that these block states are obtained by maximizing entropy, the kind of stochastic arguments that I had in the first lecture, that if this is the conserved quantity, then I can define this micro which is going to be a sum over all microstates and how was I characterizing microstates? I need to give you both this and that. So both the positions and the contact force. Yes. No, no, so this, yeah, so that's, that's what I, if I want to write this in terms of the heights, I need the RLGs. If I want to write it in terms of the forces, I need the RIJs. So this can be written 
in terms of the RLGs and the HLs. Right, so I'm saying I can either write the force moment per grain as in terms of these variables, which what is what I've done here. Exactly. Then if I, but I, it's equivalent to writing this as a sum of the loop surrounding a grain of, what did I call it, RLG? Is that clear to everyone? And then using this, right, so it's because this enforces force balance and Newton's third law that using this, then we showed that if I sum it over a bunch of grains, it becomes a boundary integral. Okay? Okay, so, but, you know, in an experiment, I can measure it this way. There's no problem. And it's, it's, no one's going to go and measure the height in the experiment, so this is the way it will be measured. So this is now a sum over all microstates, and we relax the equiprobability assumption. So what am I doing now? I'm saying there is for each configuration of R's and F's, right? So I'm labeling all of the contacts. So you give me one microstate. This is a sum over all of the contacts. In that microstate, this is labeled by the microstate, just like I could do energy, right? So the analog would be, if you gave me the energy of a microstate in, um, if I just had an ideal gas, would be the sum over all of the momenta of the particles, right? So this is the macroscopic extensive quantity. Okay. So now if this whole entropy idea is, is valid, then we would say from here that I can define a quantity, not alpha, I'm using too many alphas, we call this nu. The new are my microstates. I can construct a tensorial analog of the temperature, which will be, so if I now label it by, um, let me do the following and then you'll understand. So it's del log this thing. I'm using a sloppy shorthand notation because these are tensors, so I have to do it component by component. Right, so this now becomes, this is the analog of one over temperature, right? Or one of, or beta, right? So alpha is beta, but it's a tensor. So then if, if this is true, then this is what it will imply. If I take a big system in experiments which have grains inside it, and suppose someone has, and, and, the, and I'm controlling the stresses at the boundary, right? I'm controlling the stresses at the boundary, so what I'm controlling, just like I do in a microcanonical ensemble in thermal equilibrium, is I'm controlling the total flux. Right? Just like in a microcanonical ensemble, I'm controlling the energy of the whole system. And then if you go and ask, what do I observe in a subsystem? Right? So what's the probability of observing a particular microstate in this subsystem? Is the question clear? Right? So I'm going to fix this, and then I'm going to ask, what is the probability of finding a particular microstate given this is fixed, right? Okay. 
And that is going to be, can you guys see what I'm writing here? Yes? Okay. Is going to be proportional to, or I'll write equal to, e to the minus alpha phi of nu z phi total, where this is the usual partition function. The claim is this alpha is determined completely by phi total. Uh, this is the microcanonical, so let me make sure that this is, because this is the way experiments can test it. The point is, we have no thermometer to measure alpha, right? We measure temperature by doing what? By bringing my thermometer and my body to the same temperature, and then my thermometer has some material which has a property that shows the temperature, right? We have no way of measuring this thing now. I should tell you just for cultural reasons that Edwards actually thought about this, but only in, he didn't do it again. You know, his, his, uh, his genius was just to throw these things out at us. He had a name for this. It's a, it's a really weird name. He called it angoricity. Why is, in Greek, that means stress in the sense of anger. Not in the sense of mechanical stress, but it won he came up with this name and called it angoricity. And the name has stuck. When I first got into this, I tried to come up with a different name. But so this is called the angoricity. It's a pretty name. Okay, so what am I saying? If you give me something like this, if someone does experiments where they control the full big system, and they have a way of going inside here and measuring the probability of finding a microstate, or as you'll see in a minute, probability of finding a particular value of phi in here. Okay? Then the if the Edwards ensemble is, is correct, then you would say the probability of finding a microstate given I, of I total is that. Now I can rewrite this. So this is now, this is part of a canonical ensemble, right? That is the consequence of the Edwards ensemble if entropy is maximization controls my state and this is a conserved quantity. So the, what I said there is that alpha can only be a function of phi total. I don't know what function it is. If I knew that, I would know the, so this is the analog of in equilibrium systems, what would I, I would need to know beta as a function of energy, which is an equation of state, right? So I don't know the equation of state, right? But what I would claim is that the only variable alpha can depend upon is this phi total. So if I keep phi total fixed and change other things, alpha shouldn't change. Correct. So that's the, that's the assumption here, that phi can be easily exchanged and as people have been pointing out in this, and we will, I will talk about that, there, there is a real issue in whether that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what are these loop moves? What are, what are the fluctuations that we can have that can actually lead to an exchange of phi between these? between the subsystem and the bath. All I'm saying is if we assume all of that, then this will be true, right? And so these are, the, I am trying to, so there are big ifs. There are big ifs what we, 
what I will uh, be much, what I am much more comfortable is this concept that this phi is conserved. Now, whether a subsystem and a bath can easily exchange that, what are the dynamics that lets you do that? The dynamics is surely non ergodic, right? So, you know, how do I shake my system every time to make sure that at the end of my shaking, I have exchanged phi enough, or in the process of shaking, I have exchanged phi enough, or so that at the end state, these two things are in phi equilibrium. Right? That's a, that's a, I, I, we don't know that. And under certain protocols, it might not happen. But I'll show you what a test of a particular uh, setup that this seems to hold true. So how do you test it is what I'm trying to get at here. Okay. So how you test it then is, as I said, so alpha is this. We don't know the equation of state. If I start with this assumption, right, then the probability of finding a particular value of phi in my subsystem, right, will be the num the density, this generalized density of states. Let me just pause here and ask if that makes sense. So there are big ifs in assuming this, but if I assume this, then this follows. Right? Now we don't think much about this in the canonical ensemble in equilibrium. The fact that there is something, so the analog again here would be P of beta E, right? So I have a distribution which depends on two, two variables, the temperature and the energy. This is the energy distribution at a given temperature. Here I'm asking, what's the distribution of this force moment tensor at a given alpha? It takes a very, very special form, right? This is a distribution in the space of two variables, beta and E. Right? Equilibrium or this entropy maximization and the conservation law leads to a very special form, which if I probably write it here would be more evident just because it's simpler and more familiar. So it's a function of beta and E, where beta and E appear in a combination only in this exponential. Then I have something which depends only on E, something which depends only on beta. It's a very, very special form, right? It didn't have to be that way, right? Equilibrium leads to this. So what we are now saying is that if Edwards is correct, then this is the special form. So one can check this special form. Okay, so we first did it in simulations. Um, so what you need to do is take, do you construct a histogram of phi, and I'll show you in a minute, and then you look at the histogram at two different values of phi at the same phi total, which means at the same alpha. So if I take a ratio of those, then, sorry, I said it the other way, I do two different alphas at the same phi sub, so then this thing cancels out. I'll show it to you in a minute. Yes. No. Okay, what's the difference between this and that?
No. No. So someone, someone answer him. What's the difference between this and this? What is the, what is, so let's forget this, I rewrote it here, right? So I'm going to, yep. So what's the difference between this and this? I don't think I can move on unless I get an answer. This is the probability to find a particular microstate. But there are lots of microstates which have the same value of phi. Right? So this is the analog of the density of states. Right? So what am I doing to do here, do get this? I'm saying I'm going to sum over all my microstates with that probability. But I'm going to only look at states which have a particular value. Now, and because I have non-equal probabilities, I need an omega nu there. Yes? Yes, sorry, very good, yes. And then, so, okay, so if I put it in here, then I don't need to put it in here. Yes. Okay. So the reason I didn't put it in there is whichever way, ultimately, you're going to measure this. And so what? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to quickly show you one experimental test of this. And take it with a grain of salt. This is actually in the paper that's... Okay, so what you see up there is if you also had a volume conservation, right? So the most general form you can write is that. Okay, so this is the probability of... And so my notation change here is capital sigma is the same as my uppercase phi. Yes? Okay, so now we, so how you test this Okay, so this is illustrated in terms of the volume, but I can do this with the phi, right? So take two, two systems at different values of phi total. Okay, so in the experiment, let's say they create a large system which has one value of phi total, which is being called um, so x1 is the compactivity, so replace that by alpha 1 and alpha 2 if you want. So if I have one system with one phi total, another system with another phi total, then I, have, they, I can think of them as being created at two different values of alpha. Is that clear to everyone? Right, so the assumption is alpha is a unique function of phi total, just like beta is a unique function of the energy if I have an equilibrium equation of state. So now if I take the ratio of the value of the histograms at two different systems, right, one and two, then what we would claim is if I take the log of this and plot it as a function of v or phi, I would get a straight line with that difference in alpha one and alpha two. When we did it in the simulations, we actually did a slightly more sophisticated analysis where the z's also cancel out. Okay? And that came from a crucial idea from Don Frankel. I was talking to him saying, I want to calculate, uh, just, it was a trivial, sort of trivial thing, but I said, I also want to cancel out the partition function because it might mess things up. And he had an idea, so we used it. But in the experiments, they used that.
So here is, okay. So the top plot here are actually from my student Silke Hankins's analysis of simulations of Cory O'Hearn. And these were packings that were granular packings of frictionless particles, which were compressed to a certain value of pressure. So gamma here, or the extensive version of pressure. Gamma is the trace of phi. Okay, phi is a tensor, gamma is the trace of that, which is the internal, the, the virial. And then what we looked at was subsystems of different sizes. We got these histograms, we tried to collapse them on top of each other using this particular form. And the other thing we checked is whether alpha is an intensive quantity. If it's an intensive quantity, then it shouldn't depend on the size of the subsystem. So M is the number of grains in my subsystem, and we characterize that. So in the frictionless packing, it worked out well. I should emphasize that there are weird things that happen in the tail of these histograms. Right? So when we say we can do a data collapse using this form, it really is near that maximum. But that's not so different from what we do in equilibrium also. But in equilibrium, I know it works. Here, I should worry much more. Okay, so then the experiments from Karen Daniels's group Let's look at what they did. So, so for their system, it's friction, huh? and they have a bath, which is the blue line, which is the high friction. The bath is made out of high friction particles, and the subsystem is made out of lower friction particles. And then they take this whole thing, they tap it, let it come to rest, or shake it. It's sitting on a shaker. They shake the whole thing, let it come to rest. Do this many, 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 many times. No, there's no exchange of particles. So this is the question of can I exchange phi, right? There's no exchange of particles. But there's no explicit boundary, right? But there's no exchange of particles. Two kinds of shears. Uh, no. So the subsystem, I should have an experimental. So this, the, 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 this is inside here, and this is outside there. So really thinking of this as two species. Um, it, phi doesn't include exchanging momentum, right? So what it's saying is somehow the stresses get transmitted, right? Changing boundary conditions. It's like doing a point to set kind of thing or whatever. But it says that if this is true, then the stresses actually have propagated through the system, and I have come to some kind of equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium. So this again is the trace of phi. So no one so far has looked at all of the components of phi and their distributions, or the trace and the determinant, which are the two invariants. No one has done that. People have only looked at the trace. But they looked at two kinds of protocols. One was um, shearing. Yeah, so this was not shaking. This was compression and shearing. Sorry about that. This is not shaking. It's shearing and compression. Their original volume one was shaking. So you shear the system, you wait till every grain stops moving, and then you can calculate this. So these are two different protocols, and you do shear and compression. And again, you ask what they are showing you here is that two things. One is that the bath and the subsystem have the same alpha, right, the blue and the red. And also, roughly speaking, they follow some equation of state. It seems to be a very simple ideal gas equation of state. So one thing I should point out is that's what we found also. So it seems to us that we haven't found in these systems where Edwards has been tested, the equation of state is like an ideal gas. We haven't found a system which is non-trivial in the sense that it doesn't have an ideal gas equation of state and still Edwards is satisfied. He 
Yes. Oh, these are photo. Okay, so these are photoelastic particles, and you can measure the contact forces. So this this is this is. Uh, I might have a video. I'll show you later on. So this is the this is the beauty of what uh, Bob Beringer set up, and Karen has taken over. Karen was his postdoc, um, and Karen does it too. So photoelastic materials do what? What are photoelastic materials? I'm being like Sanat. What are photoelastic materials? That's a consequence of it being photoelastic. So what how what is the what is the property of the photoelastic material? When you put stress on them, they become something. Bifringent, thank you. Just no, you shouldn't be talking. <laughs> <laughs> They're biofringent. What does that mean? Light propagates, light with different polarizations, propagate with different speeds. So then if you look at it through a polarizer, you can look at these patterns, and over the last, now almost 30 years, they have constructed um, ways of inverting those patterns to not only get the stress on a grain, but the individual contact forces and the components, the normal and the tangential components. So you'll see that we need that absolutely to test some of our theories. Okay? So, no. 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 There is no 3D, there's a 3D hydrogel version that Bob has used, but those are hydrogels, they're frictionless but you can measure forces. But the photoelastic technique doesn't work in higher than 2D. The height map also doesn't work in higher than 2D, but the conservation of phi does work in 3D through a different uh, uh, representation, which I'm not going to talk about. There was a question somewhere. Yes. No. And there's only, that would have been a grand canonical ensemble, right? No, they do have a-thermal quasi-static shear, a-thermal quasi-static compression experimentally. Right? So they do very, 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 very small steps. Huh? I know it doesn't exist. It's being done at some rate. Oh, so by doing this, right? So, so you, what you get is alpha... 1 over alpha 1 minus 1 over alpha 2. And then you, is, then you, really what this should say is it's 1 over alpha 1 minus some 1 over alpha rep. Yes, yeah. So you cancel out the Z micro and the, and we also managed to cancel out the Z canonical. And then you get from the fits, you get a 1 over alpha 1 minus 1 over alpha 2. You say, OK, I'm going to look at either my largest stress or my smallest stress, call it a reference. And then this is it. So this really is 1 over alpha minus 1 over alpha rep. OK, I don't have a notion, I don't have a measurement of the absolute temperature here, or the absolute angoricity. But the blue and the red? Uh -huh. Different values of phi total. Different values of trace of phi total. Yeah. Alpha is a function of phi total, is the assumption. I don't know how to control alpha. Right? I'm deducing alpha by keeping P phi by phi doing two phi totals. So this is in a bit misleading in the sense I don't know how to compute x1 and x2. I don't know how to control x1 and x2. What I'm really controlling is v total 1, v total 2, or phi total 1, phi total 2. And then what the test is, 
First of all, if I keep phi total one and phi total two, two different things, is alpha a unique function of that, or this one over alpha minus one over alpha rep? And then is the bath and the subsystem at the same alpha? So each point here is a different phi total, a different gamma. Yes, so gamma is the trace of phi total. Let me write it down so that. Yeah, so you take a particular gamma, either created through pure compression gamma, or you shear and you measure gamma, and then you look at this. Seems reasonably convincing, but as I said, you know, Yes, all of the ones that we have worked out have ideal gas equation of state. So I think whether the Edwards ensemble works or not, there's a quote unquote yes, but I would still take it with a grain of salt, okay? Okay. That's right. Correct, including the omega. So we don't know what the individual omegas are. We can calculate the Z micro. And it all looks like an ideal gas. We've done this with, so Karen did it here. We did it with shared experiments from Bob Beringer's. And if you do the distribution, if you map it out, they all look ideal gas-like. There are issues that goes back to this whole thing of what if I have system spanning loops, do I have factorizability, etc., which we saw some hints of in how the phi subsystem scales with the subsystem size. So there are hints of weirdness which I think are interesting, but no one has really explored those very, very carefully. It's difficult to do it. Right, so in there, in a, it, in some limit, in some maybe very close to my if my most typical my typical states might actually follow this, but a lot of the granular things are controlled by atypical states, states in the in the tails of the distributions, and I don't think we can say anything about this. Yeah. No, no, you know, what, why would I get ideal gas? I would say it the other way. Wherever we have found the Edwards to work, it seems it's an ideal gas. There are other places where we haven't been able to test the Edwards, so I don't even know how to construct the equation of state, but there I know there are funny states. But no one has tested Edwards or the equation of state there. Vishnu, yes. Yes, so gamma is going down. So you're asking if I can go very close to, that's, I would say again, take it with a grain of salt, right? So this has gone to pressures of only about 10 to the minus three, which are actually pretty large pressures. Close to unjamming, when we do simulations, it's like 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus 10. In silkers, frictionless it worked, because there we could go down to very, very small pressures, but that's frictionless your compression, okay? I will talk about jamming, but shear jamming, so that's where I'm going to go. So you'll see what I'm, I'm it's okay, I'm going to set aside Edwards, but I'm going to use the height map to understand some phenomena related to jamming. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. It's a really good question. So, so, so the ideal gas is completely inconsistent with the stress stress autocorrelation, stress stress correlation functions. Do we see? So, I, I, you know, one possibility is that yes, it works, but it's completely uh, informationless because it doesn't tell me anything, right? 
in some macroscopic way this works, but I have no, it doesn't tell me that these have long range stress press correlations, there is no, there are no uh, length scales in here, etc. So, so I talked about it because there is a lot of discussion of the Edwards Ensemble, etc. My main focus over the last at least five years has been to just to try and understand what the height patterns are and see if there's a statistical mechanics one can construct, which is Edwards-like. Okay? Yeah, it's a, it's, so this is what, when we were doing analyzing uh, my ex-student Max B, when he analyzed the sh shear jam states of Bob Behringer, that's what I'm saying, where it showed up, the long range correlations showed up in not a good scaling of phi with the system size. Right, so you know, so you would think that if I had a correlation length, I go beyond that, then everything scales. But if I have a long range, correlate, long range correlations, then it will never be true. So there are hints that there are things here that have been shoved under the rug. And probably the issue is that, and I go very close to unjamming all of this falls apart. Okay, so, yes, Atsushi. So the pressure fluctuations in, from this perspective should be controlled by alpha. And what this is saying is I have ideal gas-like fluctuations, right? Which, uh, but, but if you also look at unjamming things, all of these distributions, you know, people claim are Gaussians. So maybe all of this is, you know, this is, maybe we're not looking at the right quantities is basically what I'm trying to say. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about, oh my God, okay. Okay, so where this formalism of the height, and I'll use a slightly different representation, but you, everyone remembers what these heights are? They sit on loops, they are vectors, and they circulate in clockwise or counterclockwise, whatever my convention is, right? So, the question we set out to ask is if we can understand some, what I would call very athermal, granular kind of phase transitions. And the two phase transitions, and because of the lack of time, I think I'll just talk about one. Which one is the front one, right? Top one, right? Oh, I see. So I think I'm only going to talk about this because I don't have time to talk about both. So um, let me just ignore this, ignore the left side. It's more complicated to analyze. Let's focus on this, which is not a dry granular system. It's a suspension of large grains, a dense suspension in a Newtonian fluid. So the fluid is simple. There's grains that are suspended, the grains are densely packed. Pinaki is asking me to ask you guys if you know what a Newtonian fluid is. The Newtonian fluids and solids, so I think that's a good thing to ask because you'll see lots of huge Newtonian, non-Newtonian effects. So Newtonian fluid is where the stress and the strain rate have a linear dependence. And a Newtonian solid is where the stress and the strain have a linear dependence, which has a sh modulus, right? Okay, so this system has been now studied since about 2012, has been extensively studied. And what I'm showing you here is the particle packing fraction. So, you know, what fraction, uh, what's the concentration of these particles suspended in the fluid? This is an imposed shear stress. So these are from simulations, and I'll focus again only on that. Um, so stress-controlled simulation. So one component of this stress 
is being controlled. So if I want to think in terms of an ensemble, one component of my phi is being controlled. Okay, the other components of the phi can fluctuate. And what you observe is something called a continuous shear thickening, a discontinuous shear thickening, and this is a discontinuous plus thickening for shear jamming. And I will try to explain what all of those things are phenomenologically. So this is the phenomena. This was observed uh, in, amongst others, but the, well, there's a nice review article by Eric Brown and Heinrich Jaeger. So, oh sorry, so they use tau instead of sigma, I use sigma. It's the shear stress. So if you look at the shear stress as a function of the imposed shear rate at different packing fractions. Okay, this is all in 3D. So there is a nominal packing fraction where if I just had, and I'll come to this, if I had just friction, the sort of rate independent rheology, then there's a packing fraction where the viscosity diverges and nominally it's this. So what they're showing is that if I look at the stress as a function of shear rate at different packing fractions, so at very, very low packing fractions, or the pure suspension is Newtonian, right? Sigma is just going as gamma dot, or tau is just going as gamma dot. Now they keep increasing the packing fraction. And what you see is that at this yellow one, there is something interesting happening, right? What's happening? The stress is Just describe what you're seeing. Here, the stress was increasing linearly with gamma dot. What's happening here? Or if I turn the, turn the, rotate it, gamma dot is staying constant as stress is increasing, right? So this is like a transition where sigma changes at constant gamma dot. Or the shear stress is changing at constant gamma dot. So keep that in mind. If I measure the viscosity, what it's saying is the viscosity here is a constant, right? That's Newtonian. Now I'm looking at viscosity as a function of the shear, impulse shear stress. And at this yellow point, which they haven't shown, there's one stress at which I'll get a slope of one. So the viscosity is scaling precisely as the shear stress. And at the red point where you see this sort of uh, S-shaped curve appearing here. There are two points very close to each other where sig the, the viscosity is scaling as the stress. So that take that as a definition of discontinuous shear thickening. It's having some values of stress at which the viscosity scales as the shear stress, which essentially then says the gamma dot has to be constant as that is happening. I'm going to show you that. So, so this is, so this then, where was I going to show you that? Okay, actually I'm going to go back here. So this is from 2D, but if you just replace the numbers, it's the same thing is happening in 3D. What this red line is, are the points at which the viscosity is proportional to the shear stress, right? So what this is telling me is that if I look at low enough packing fractions, there are no values of the shear stress at which viscosity scales with the stress. As I come to this point, right, beyond that, I start seeing two points at which I have this feature. So this line, I'm going to write it down, is a locus of Right? Because at those points, the viscosity scales at the shear stress, so the gamma dot doesn't change. Okay, so as Pinaki was pointing out, so if I turn this around and make phi my vertical axis and stress my horizontal axis, 
Look at the red curve. Forget about the blue, the sheer jam. Does it remind you of some well-known phase transition? When I map the, not in terms of phi and sigma, but in terms of something else. So I'm saying, if I now turn this around, this is phi, this is sigma. I have something that looks like that. This part is weird. If I did something like this, so I replace this by temperature and this by density. Giving you all kinds of hints. This is TC of liquid gas, right? Right? So the so if I make the mapping that the packing fraction is like temperature, the stress or the extensive version of it is what we should really think about this phi is or is, the stress is like the density or the, the flux is like the volume. And then what is gamma dot? If I say sigma is like the volume, gamma dot is like the? What's the conjugate variable to volume? Pressure, right? So gamma dot is like the pressure. So along that line then, right, I have dp dv equal to zero, which is precisely how this is the instability line. It's not the two-phase coexistence line. It's the instability line, right? The spinodal line is what they're drawing, right? So this is suggestive that there is some kind of a critical packing fraction here below which things happen, okay? So there is a mean field theory which looks exactly like the van der Waals, which was constructed by Matthew Biat and Mike Cates and other people um, so maybe I'll skip. Okay. Um, it was based on this observation. The mean field theory is based on the following observation. The mean field theory is based on the observation that if I ask how many frictional contacts do I have with the grain? Okay, so I haven't even told you. So the understanding now is that what happens as you impose higher and higher shear stress on this system, so this is a dense packing of particles suspended in a fluid. There is fluid between the particles. There is some kind of repulsive interaction that keeps the grains apart. So there is a lubrication layer between them. There's a fluid layer between them. If I keep in increasing the shear stress, at some point I overcome this and I made grain on grain solid contact. Does that make sense? It's not lubricated anymore. That's the physical understanding and it's been tested by all kinds of experiments that you need that, that transition from lubricated contacts to solid on solid frictional contacts. And since I have these large grains, of course, as soon as I make contact, those contacts are frictional because there's some roughness at the surface. So if you then ask what is the fraction of frictional contacts as a function of the imposed shear stress. You can do this, so this is all done in 3D at different packing fractions, and you see this universal curve. Right? So the fraction of frictional contacts does not depend on the packing fraction, but you see this sigmoidal curve, right? Which is telling me that. that thinks that around here somewhere, it's not a sharp transition, but there is a strong dependence of the, on the number of frictional contacts on the stress. And then this is the, so the idea is that these are all consequences of that. So in this, some sense, this is like an order parameter which enters the mean field theory. So I'm gonna show you the mean field theory 
So the idea, the idea behind the mean, so this is necessarily very, very short, but the idea behind the mean field theory is the following, is based on theories of suspension rheology, but rate independent suspension rheology. So this blue curve, no, sigma is controlled. Sigma is controlled. Yeah, but I'm not controlling F, I'm controlling sigma, right? No, 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 but the picture, the picture is you're creating more and more frictional contacts. So what you're asking is, is the consequence of that that you're increasing stress? It's a pretty sharp function of sigma, right? Yeah, yeah, it's log sigma. Yes, but, but, but it is changing as a function of sigma, yes. Yeah, it's not a sharp function. And one of the points they make in the mean field theory is it doesn't have to be very sharp. There has to be just some change in this. So, right, so the picture is, the picture behind the mean field theory is the following, that if I had a suspension where I suspended frictionless grains. This I can don't do only in simulations. I cannot do in, there are no frictionless grains. But if I do that and measure the viscosity as a function of the packing fraction of grains, then there is a packing fraction at which this viscosity diverges. I'm not going to dwell on names associated with them, right? Okay, so there's a viscosity at which if I suspended frictionless grains in a Newtonian fluid, the viscosity diverges. Now I can suspend uh, grains with higher and higher friction coefficient in these fluids. And it's known that if I suspend, let's say, some frictional grains with a nominal frictional coefficient of mu, then the viscosity diverges at a lower packing fraction. Okay? Now, the idea behind the mean field theory is what's going on is that low stresses I have this kind of suspension where every contact is lubricated, there are no frictional contacts, so the system is following this blue line. That makes sense? But over some range of stress, I'm creating more and more frictional contact, so I go from here to here. Because my rheology then changes from being frictionless to frictional. Okay, that's the, that's the idea behind the mean field theory. And if you just put that in, you do get a very successful mean field theory that reproduces all of the stress strain curves the, in the, uh, that are observed experimentally. So I'm just going to ignore, or if you know about it, you know, otherwise forget it. But this is what the mean field theory of Matthew Wyatt and my case is based on, is that the stress in a rate, in, is rate independent rheology is this, but this viscosity depends on the packing fraction, which I showed you, right? The viscosity depends on the packing fraction. And the viscosity depends on what friction coefficient I have. So then they said, okay, so this viscosity, I showed you diverges at some phi. Yes? Right? A different phi for frictional and frictionless. So they just extended this whole concept to saying, okay, the, the packing fraction at which my viscosity diverges, which now depends on the imposed stress. Because it's just a linear superposition of saying, this is the fraction of frictional contacts, and that fraction of the fluid or the suspension will diverge at some packing fraction corresponding to that friction coefficient. And this is the fraction of friction less contacts that will diverge at a much higher packing fraction. So if I just do this, I put this in, I take some function of F, which is reasonably smoothly varying, but varies, uh, it has some variation. If you do that, you can put this in, you get a very, you get an equation that looks very van der Waalse between the sigma and gamma dot, just like pressure and volume. And what you start seeing then is, so this is pressure, but you can think of it as the shear stress, shear stress versus strain rate from this theory at different packing fractions, you start seeing the van der Waals loop. 
Yes? It's just a pure, the, we, we look at this equation for this, it's just van der Waals. But it comes from, again, this kind of a feedback thing. Okay? So the question that we set out to answer is what's the stat mag behind this? Right? So liquid gas transition, Ising model, we now understand completely what the stat mag is behind van der Waals. If I make the system more complicated, it might not be van der Waals, it might be something else, but we know how to do the stat mag. So can we do something that goes beyond this? And all of this goes. So what we noticed, and people had not actually dwelled on this, but we dwelled on it because we had seen it in dry grain shear jamming, is as you undergo this transition, right? So this is, uh, these are all from simulations. Let's forget about this. For now, it's a regime that the suspension shear things, but it's not interesting to us. So as a function of shear stress, and these are now uh, two dimensions, so the nominal phi j is like 0.84 with the friction less jamming would take place or the viscosity would divert. So what you see is as you undergo this transition from into this discontinuous shear thickening regime, so within, within this dome, then you also see this reduction in the macroscopic stress and isotropy. So what I'm saying is I'm taking my capital phi and looking at the determinant over the trace, right? That's a measure of the anisotropy of, and what you see is that decreases, which is, should surprise you. Because what I was saying before is I increase the fraction of frictional contact. Right? So if I kept in my network the same and increased friction coefficient, my friction, macroscopic friction coefficient should go up, right? So what's happening is the network is changing dramatically. So here you have frictional contacts that are more, more or less one-dimensional. Here you have frictional contacts that form more and more two-dimensional structures, which is why this macroscopic stress and isotropy goes down. So the question was, can we understand this? And from this, if I know mu, I can also write down a theory for the viscosity and I can construct the flow curves, etc. So this is the macroscopic quantity we tried to get a stat mag description of. Okay. So this is what I have shown you guys, right? This is the height representation. I'm, I don't have time to talk about it, but in these suspensions, there's also a fluid. So the grains actually, in addition to the contact forces and the lubricated forces, lubrication forces, which I can think of pairwise, also have a Stokes drag. There are body forces. So we needed to extend this, and I don't have time to go into that at all. We needed to extend this to include body forces, which for anyone who's interested in granular is actually a very significant step because now we can look at things under gravity. We have a way of generalizing the height to include uh, body forces. So keeping that in mind that, that we can do that, so we can come up with a height representation that um, what I'm saying is there's a way of modifying this so that I have other fields on the right-hand side so that the grain forces now don't, the contact forces don't add up to zero, but add up to the body force. But I can, including that, the left-hand side will still be zero, and I have some H prime sitting here. We can construct this. So just take my word for it now, because I don't have time to go into it. OK, but I'm going to do the following. Let's see if I have. OK, so there's another way of thinking about the height field, where I'm going to forget about this full topology of, you know, the heights are circulating around the loops, etc., cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to say there is a height vector that I can associate with each loop. I don't care precisely where it sits because it does sit on this, it flows around this boundary. But there is a, there is a height vector associated with each loop surrounding a grain. So I can construct a representation 
which preserves the topology of that contact network, but I don't have any information about the RIJs. I don't have any information about how, what the distances are. Okay, but I know that grain one is surrounded by loop two, three, four, and grain one is in contact with grain two, etc. I have all of that. So again, I, I, I can do this at the tutorial or make you guys do it because this is another way of thinking of the height. So what I can do is I look at the red particle and I say this forces add up to zero, right? So I can say, okay, I'm gonna just put these forces down head to tail. And because they add up to zero, they form a closed polygon. Now with frictional, this polygon can be self-intersecting, non-convex, all of that. But the vertices of this polygon are just my heights. Does that make sense? So now I can go to a simpler, I'm forgetting fully about sort of the disordered contact network and its details, and go here, and then I have these tiles. This is constructed from a particular experimental configuration, and these vertices are my heights. So what I have is a height pattern. Does that make sense? I have a height pattern, and then we are going to just ask what are the statistics of these height patterns. We have done this in several cases. Um, let me just switch to... There was all the whole thing. Okay, so... What I'm showing you here is we looked at simulations performed by Jeff Morris and his group on the suspensions. For each, this is a snapshot at some packing fraction and some imposed shear stress. I have a snapshot, I have a time series. One thing to remember here is these are non-equilibrium steady states. They're being driven. I have a whole time series. And I can look at each snapshot and I can construct this height map because I know all of the forces, okay? So the points I'm showing you here are these points. So there are tiles, you know, there are edges connecting these, but I've taken them away. Okay, and there are all kinds of things that I'm shoving under the rug, but this is a point pattern, right? So if I told you these were particles in a box, you would think these are particles in a box, but they're truly point particles. Yes? Okay, so then I can do what I would do if these were particles. And I can ask, do, so if this was an ideal gas, okay, actually I should say something because, so yesterday there were questions saying, you know, so these heights, I said I can keep the flux preserved with changes in the height. What kinds of changes could we do in the heights was a question, right, internally? If you look at this, the shape of this box in this space is controlled by the imposed capital phi. So these vectors, this vector and that vector, are the, the so the full uh, phi is made out of a stacking of these vectors, okay? So if I control phi completely, I control the shape of this box. Anyone, I know I'm losing you guys, but if I, if I had no other constraints except for force balance, then what would I say? that? any point pattern inside here is an allowed state. If that was true, I would get what? An ideal gas of these particles in a box, right? No other constraints, the heights can do whatever they want to do. I would get ideal gas, there would be no correlations between these particles, no G2 that uh, Shannon talked about, right? But there are these other constraints. There's torque balance, the friction, Coulomb law, the positivity constraint, all of those lead to correlations. We don't have a theory to predict those correlations. They can measure those correlations. Yes? So this is like if someone gave you a colloidal system and you had no idea of what it was, I could measure G2 and try to get some understanding of it. Yes? So that's precisely what we did. Right? We asked, how do the G2s of these points right, not particles, the point pattern, so this is a G2 of H, okay, so we measure it for each snapshot, we do a time series average, so this is in non-equilibrium steady state, we measure the G2s. Oh, 
Okay, and the question, so this is just, and the question we ask is in the, exper in the experiments or simulations, they control only the shear stress, not the pressure, because if they did everything, if they controlled everything, then this macroscopic friction coefficient would not change. That's also control. So they control only the shear stress, which in this bulk geometry translates to saying they control this, this um, component and this component of these two vectors. The other components can fluctuate. So the, the thinking in our head was that if there are non-trivial correlations between the heights, those correlations will drive box fluctuations and average box shapes under the constraint that these two are kept fixed. Okay, these two are kept fixed, but this one can fluctuate, right? The box can get thinner or thicker, keeping this fixed. And the idea was this is not some, this comes from some microscopic correlations, and that's what we wanted to check. Okay, so these are the measured correlations. And when I say measured, we took the snapshots from the simulations and we constructed the G2s. Okay, now this is G2. If G2 is one everywhere, then it is like an, going back to Professor Das Gupta's lectures, G2 is one. That is an ideal gas, right? If I don't subtract the one. So if G2 is less than one, that means I have a kind of a repulsion. If G2 is greater than one, I have some kind of an attraction. Does that make sense? If G2 is less than one, that means the points are farther apart than I expect from just throwing them down like an ideal gas. If this is greater than one, then they're closer together than that, right? So what I'm showing you here is G2, and these black regions are where the height points are farther apart than I expect from ideal gas. So statistically, that is telling me that the forces are larger in that, along those directions because the, the vectors connecting the heights are the contact forces, or the forces with the body forces, everything, the effective forces. So if I have G2, if I have heights separated by large vectors, then I would get G2 to be smaller than one. So this is saying along this direction, the forces are larger, and that makes complete sense. Because when I shear something, there's a short diagonal and a long diagonal, right? Along the short diagonal, I have Compressive forces, this is the dilational direction. Remember, these are non-cohesive, right? So more stress along this direction, less stress along that direction. So this makes complete sense. This is that low packing fractions, low shear stresses. This is the kind of pattern you see. Now what you see when I increase, even at the same stress, if I increase the packing fraction, is there is a change in the shape of this G2, right? The red lobes sort of rotate from all being in these two quadrants to starting to be there. And if I increase the packing fraction even more near shear jamming, this is even more dramatic. If I increase the shear stress, there's also some changes in G2. Okay, so what we said was let's just do the simplest possible thing, which is ignoring all of the virials and then say, I have a G2, which is e to the minus v2. I have, I don't know what the pair potential is here, right? It's created by all of these constraints. There is no pair potential. There is a G2. And I'm saying, let's make the simplest assumption that's the only, the pair correlations are the only things that matter. If I do that, I can write down an effective potential, and then we actually do stat mech. Right, so these are the pair potentials, and you, what you see, is it's extremely anisotropic, and they, they are attractive in the blue regions, repulsive in the red regions. So funny potentials. Okay, very funny potentials. Okay? But with this, we can just do the following. So I'm, what I'm assuming here is my restatement of the Edwards idea. I'm saying I have a 
sequence of dynamical states created by some dynamics. I'm imposing a shear, I have dynamical laws, they are doing Stokes uh, simulations, I have a sequence of states, but let me, if I postulate that there's an a priori probability for finding these states, that probability is determined by a pair potential coming from G2. So that's like a very equilibrium kind of assumption, right? So I'm saying then I'm going to construct a V from the G2 and then I'll calculate the quote-unquote energy of these particle configurations from this G2. And then with that energy function, I do Monte Carlo to figure out what this macroscopic box shape is, which tells me what the macroscopic friction coefficient is. So we're just doing complete sort of equilibrium statistical mechanics, and I didn't expect it to work as well as it did, but it did. But lots of caveats here, right? So what we do then is um, using that energy function, compute a quote unquote free energy, which we can calculate as a function of this macroscopic friction coefficient. So I can, so I can do, I'm doing a microcanonical sampling of the energy at a fixed macroscopic friction coefficient and I see, what I see is as I change this at different packing fractions or different stresses, there is a well-defined minimum and that minimum changes. So my average value of the macroscopic friction coefficient changes. So this is what we get using this pair potential and this ansatz that I have an a priori probability. So this is mu as a function of shear stress for different packing fractions. And you start seeing this, these changes. I can, from this, compute this d gamma dot d sigma because there's a relationship. And you see that at a certain packing fraction, I start seeing two intersections. Right? So I can take that, I can generate my tie lines. I have, unfortunately, data from them for only sort of three packing fractions. Here is where I can't draw it because it's just asymptotes to that. And then there are two. But roughly speaking, it generates the same physics. This is pretty remarkable in my mind, that we took these height patterns. I don't know what, how the constraints are playing a role or how the constraints are controlling the height pattern. But if I just say that I'll measure that, I don't know what the Edwards omega alpha is, is basically what I'm saying. But I'll construct that from the G2s and then I'll just do Edwards in a microcanonical sense and I get a very good description of this. Okay, so I'm going to end there because I have and we, I'm sure the last part I went so fast that uh, and hopefully there are questions, right? So, so what's the takeaway? That there is a change in the pattern of height, whereas if I looked at pair correlations in real space, I didn't show you this, you can measure the pair correlations in real space of these grains across this transition, nothing changes. Because going back to what I said the first lecture, I can move the grains by a tiny, tiny amount and I make or break contact. And that changes forces a lot, but from a positional pair correlation or correlation functions, basically nothing is changing. So stress correlations, again, are always parallel. So at least as far as we can see, there's nothing, there's no length scale. So again, I do see this. So a question is, right, is this just a bifurcation or is there something diverging there? We see nothing diverging. Okay, so I have managed to capture this from an equilibrium-like framework, which tells me that there are two points at which my d gamma dot d sigma is zero. But it doesn't tell me, I, we haven't been able to find any susceptibility that diverges there. 
So I haven't been able to find any correlation functions which has a length scale diverging there, length scale, force scale, whatever you want to call it, right? You haven't found that. Okay, let me end there because I, so the upshot of this last part, which I went through very quickly, is saying that we have been restating the Edwards conjecture in the following way. You give me a sequence of states which are created by some kind of non-equilibrium dynamics, can that sequence, this non-equilibrium steady state sequence, be reproduced by some a priori distribution? I don't know what this a priori distribution is going to be, but I can measure it from correlations. And if there is a, such an a priori distribution, then that at least some level, Edwards is correct. That's already a big step, right? It's saying I don't have to do the dynamics, there is a a priori distribution. But that a priori distribution, I have no way of predicting. Okay, let me stop there. Yes. You're saying this is phi, yes. I can say this is one over phi. This is temperature going up, this is phi going down. Yes. But free energy, quote unquote, right? It's a free. Et so we didn't do it that way. What you're? T I'm constructing sort of the analog of the thermodynamic free energy. I'm not writing down a Landau Ginzburg. That there is. We still haven't been able to do it. This is what we are hopefully going to do over the next two months. So I don't have a, a free energy functional. What I can do is say, okay, this is my sampling potential. I can just run it in a box using Monte Carlo, using this sampling, right? That's all we did. Does that make sense? Uh, so we fix the, so okay. So we keep these two fixed because the, the shear stress fixes that. Then we assume that the normal stress is zero. So then there's only another component and we actually let it fluctuate. Yes. I didn't do it. It was Karen Daniels. I don't do experiments. I would, yes, but yes, yes. <laughs> Correct. It doesn't have to be, right? This is because, so in equilibrium stat man, do I have to have the same system for them to equilibrate? I'm putting my mercury thermometer next to me. Right? Temperature equilibration is not between two same systems. That is, that is a big thing, right? I can take, as long as they can exchange energy, right? So the reason it falls apart for a granular system in contact with the air here is they're not exchanging energy. So there's, if, as long as the energy scale is similar so that I can exchange energy, I can have, you know, my uh, sonnets, my cells in contact with a fluid, they will equilibrate, right? So that's the same way. So one question one could ask is if I took very big particles and very small particles, at some level this will fall apart, right? That's like saying I am taking the air molecules with the, or if I make the energy separation very large, it's not energy, the stress separation, very hard particles and very soft particles, that might fall apart too because there's an energy, the stress scale there that doesn't match up. That's by fitting to the distribution. You're assuming that that's the distribution. So you construct the histograms at a given gamma. You assume this form. It's testing this assumption. So one thing I can say is what it's testing is this particular form of the distribution. 
right? And I have a little bit of problem with the way the experiments are done because if you actually don't cancel out the partition function, there are things that can come in that are problematic, which is why when we were doing the simulations, we made sure that the, uh, the partition functions cancel out. Yeah, so those are repeated experiments. So if I assume this, right? So now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to just put gamma 1 there because the idea is that I have some phi total whose trace is gamma 1, right? Because alpha is a function of gamma 1. So I don't know what function of gamma 1 it is. Right? Or of gamma. Let me just do gamma. So now I measure this at two different gammas. And I take the ratio. Right? So P gamma 1, phi over P gamma 2, same phi. So I construct two histograms. And I take the ratio of its value at the same phi at two different gammas. And this then tells me that I have e to the minus alpha 1 minus alpha 2, and they just do gamma, right? And then I have a z uh, z of i, z of i, which cancels out, but this z stays. Z of gamma 2 over Z of gamma 1. And then I take the gamma 1, gamma 2, and then I do a whole series of i's. And then I plot that. So that's the way they did it. <laughs> 